Cleaning out the basically your mind, body, and your spirit, but through cleansing, juicing, uh, eating a very high raw food, live foods diet. Um, I sort of came to this through my little girl, Ella, as you can see in the picture here behind me. She was born with uh, looking absolutely stunning, but by the time she got to eight months, she was reacting to nearly every single food group that I tried to put into her little system. And um, I'll tell you more about her after the demo. I'll just continue with uh, showing you how to make some raw food treats. So we're gonna do some superfood brownies. So I would really love a helper if someone wants to volunteer. Your hand went up first. I'm going to blend this up. You are fun. <laughs> yeah, there's nearly a brownie somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to just put this in and flatten it down. At home, preferably you would either put this in the fridge for a couple of hours or you just freeze it for maybe half an hour just to let it set so that you can cut it into slices. I've got clean hands. So. <laughs> I was so ill that I was hospitalised three times. I was put on a drip because I ruptured my esophagus. I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. And I was 12 weeks pregnant. So... I remember the night that, uh, or actually the day that I went to hospital, I had gone to my GP and my GP said, no, no, you're fine, you know, I just got a bit of morning sickness. And I'm like, no, no, this, this doesn't feel like morning sickness. I feel like I'm dying. And he just looked at me, no, 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 you're fine. You're fine, you don't need to go to hospital, just wait. So in my head, I remember thinking, wait for what? What am I waiting for? I'm 12 weeks pregnant, I don't really understand. And I left because most people, we, you know, we trust the GP. That's what we do. We go to the GP, we trust what they say because we're giving away our power to them. You know? And all they're doing is they're guesstimating. They're guesstimating on what is wrong with you. They'll look up in their little book, or nowadays it's on their computer or on their iPad, and they'll Google it and they'll guesstimate what's wrong with you. And because there's so little of the population that had this condition, my GP just didn't have a clue. So I got back in the car. I was in floods of tears. I was like, this is not right. I, you know, I know something is severely wrong. But I went home, and a few hours later, the vomit and all started again. You know, and got to the point where I really couldn't cope, where you know, I was 29, and I wanted my mum. <laughs> I really wanted my mum. You know, when you get ill, I just think that's like your go-to response. Is like, no matter what age you are, it's like, oh, I really need my mum. And I was so ill. And she came over, and I was like, you know, talking to her about it. She said, no, no, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. But it really wasn't fine. And she, as soon as she left, it was almost like because my mind could be taken off it a little bit, I could just sort of focus on speaking to someone about it. As soon as she'd gone, it all kicked in again. And I got rushed to hospital with a ruptured esophagus. And they had to inject me with morphine at 12 weeks. And they couldn't find a vein. You know, I spent at least an hour trying to find a vein where they could actually inject me with morphine so that <coughs> I could stop screaming. And eventually when they did it, it was like absolutely instant relief because I'd have been in so much pain. I just remember saying, oh my God, it's a miracle. And the doctors actually laughed out loud. I think they were in relief that they'd actually managed to get it into me. And I'm not saying that anyone should be on morphine when they're pregnant, but at that time for me, I was so desperate. You know, I just, I didn't know how to cope. And when they put fluid back into my body, because I was severely hydrated, they had to put in six pints of fluid. So I don't know how my daughter survived. She obviously was taking all of the <laughs> fluids, and I obviously had none. Um, so moving on to when she was born, everything seemed to be OK. You know, I spent six months really unable to move. But luckily for me, the last three months, I could start eating again, and I could start moving again. There are some women out there who don't even get to experience that until the baby's born. So I, was, I consider myself lucky in that regard. Um, 
when she came out, she looked like the perfect child and it seemed to be fine. You know, I breastfed her. I was very, very clear um, from a really instinctual place that I did not want her on formula. I really didn't. And I didn't know about health at that point. You know, I thought I was healthy. I didn't know about health the way that I know about it now. I just knew that I didn't want them to put formula into my child. And they did try to make me because uh, there was some trouble with her feeding, probably because of all the antibiotics they put me on. You know, she came out into the world with no good bacteria in her system at all. And we need that to be healthy. If your gut isn't healthy, then you're not healthy. And she had no good bacteria. So really, even though she looked like the perfect baby, she wasn't healthy. So it meant by the time, you know, fast tracking on to eight months, really when she started getting the grasp of food, you know, she reacted to every single thing and she became bloated and swollen and, you know, she had marks all over her face. So I just want to show you, I don't know if you can see that very clearly. This is actually her when her skin wasn't too bad. It used to sort of go up and down, up and down. I've got worse pictures, but unfortunately couldn't get them on this today. This is another one, she was one. You can see here, it was on her face. The, the worst parts were on her face and on her hands, and it was all over her body as well. But these were the, the two main areas, and these would be so bad they would just bleed. She would scratch them till they bled. Now, I remember going into her room um, when, you know, when she was about eight months, and that was what triggered everything off. She had scratched herself so badly, there was blood everywhere. It was all over the place, and she was screaming. And I couldn't bear it to see that. So, emotions. <laughs> so basically, after that point, I decided I had to do whatever it took to basically get my child clean and clear of this because really my GP, again, didn't have a clue. I already knew that. I'd experienced that. And, we, you know, I even took her to York Hill Children's Hospital, you know, because that's what they say. You go to the children's hospital when you don't know what to do. So we went there. And they didn't have a clue what to do either. They just did not know. They sent me to a nutritionist who didn't have a clue. You know, and I knew this because I'd been researching. I became really obsessed, <laughs> manically obsessed, researching it. Uh, you know, she was saying to me, if you're not going to give your daughter dairy, because she would vomit if she ever had dairy, then you must give her soy. I'm not giving her soy milk. I know that that causes man-made estrogens in the body. I'm not going to give her that multiple times in the day because you're telling me I'm supposed to do it. Oh, don't worry about that, it only affects boys. No, that, there's no way that can be. We're all hormonal beings. We're all full of hormones. So I just refused. And it was the same with the GP in there, you know, in the hospital. He wanted me to put two steroid creams on her skin that you're not supposed to even use on adult skin. And he went away because I told him I wasn't gonna do it. He spoke to his colleague and came back with the prescription. That was what they gave me, that was my choice. He said, you're on your own if you don't do this. So I said, oh, I'm on my own then, and I left. And I swore I would never go back. And I'm not saying that the hospital is not a good place to be. You know, if I broke a leg, if something severely wrong happened to me, I would want to be there. You know, I know there's lots of good people working in the NHS, but in this realm, when it comes to allergies, we don't know what we're dealing with. And also, the people that do know, the people somewhere that know, they don't want us to know because if we then know, we'll change our diets, we'll get healthy, and they won't be able to prescribe us things that they get lots of money for. So I urge any of you, if any of you have anything going on, really to seek out your own knowledge. Don't give your power away just because we're told that that's what we're supposed to do. Yes. Yeah. I'm right. <laughs> So most of us are walking about in a really sedentary lifestyle. You know, we go to work, we do our job, we come home, we watch TV, so we're numbed out by that, we're numbed out by the foods that we're eating. When you get to a place where you're not numb anymore, you're clean, you have more clarity, this is when you start to be able to get to the truth of why you're here. And that's what I really want to encourage. You know, I have a massive passion for the truth and a massive passion for people reaching their true selves, you know, their full potential. You know, without the hardships that I've been through, without actually going through my own emotions, I wouldn't be standing here today doing this.